Hello, and thank you for joining us tonight as we continue our Distinguished Speaker Series at the Pennsylvania College of Art and Design. My name is Elena Coates, and I am the Director of Exhibitions at the College. Tonight's programming is hosted by PCAD's Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in partnership with the Liberal Arts Department and the Main Gallery. First, I would like to formally state our recognition, gratitude, and appreciation to the indigenous people of the land and the enduring relationship that exists between the indigenous peoples and their traditional territories in which PCAD is located. Our formal statement, including the many diverse First Nations people of this territory can be found in the chat box. Second, I want to let everyone know that we're taping tonight's lecture for the college's archives. And please feel free to use the reactions button at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand and ask questions after tonight's lecture. In 2017, I was asked to moderate a panel discussion at the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center. And this panel discussion featured the grant winners for the Artist Lab Fellows. Jose Villalobos work was an installation featured. De La Misma Pil was an installation work that juxtaposed identity-based concepts of sexuality and acceptance alongside traditional Norteño symbols of masculinity. Since that exhibition, I have had the pleasure to embark on a number of projects with Jose Villalobos and it's an immense honor to work with him each and every time as his practice grows and his notoriety flourishes. Some of Villalobos prestigious accomplishments include the Joan Mitchell, Joan Mitchell Painters and Sculptures Grant and Residency, the Artist Lab Fellowship Grant, the Tan Foundation Award, and his work has been exhibited nationally and internationally, including at Art Pace, where he currently has an exhibition. Albright College, the Blanton Museum of Art, K Space Contemporary, McNay Art Museum, Mex de Arte Museum, El Paso Museum of Art, and the Museo de Arte de Ciudad Juarez, among many others. It is my pleasure to introduce and please give a warm welcome to Jose Villalobos. Hello, I hope everyone is doing good. Um, well, I'll just uh, like to uh, take this time to kind of um, introduce myself a little bit more and kind of uh, dive into what I do as an artist. Um, so uh, my name is Jose Villalobos and um, I'm originally from El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. So I was raised in the border. And um, as growing up, the border really uh, implemented um, my identity as a person. And I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen so I can kind of uh, dive into what I do. But overall, my practice is installation, um, sculptural installation, performance work. Um, I like to play around with a lot of materials. And I mean, that's, that's the beauty of being an artist is being able to just kind of take everything that's around you and, and um, use it. So I'm going to share my screen. And okay. Sorry, I'm fairly new to uh, this whole new Mac. Uh, let's see. Wait. Oh, give me a second. All right. Okay, so everybody can see the slides fine? Thumbs up, okay. Okay, so um, we're gonna be talking about um, challenging uh, toxic masculinity and the marginalization of queer bodies specifically to, um, I talk about a lot of the work of how I connect to it being uh, a Norteño and being from the border. And uh, just to know a little bit about uh, who I am, the on this soy. So I'm uh, 
Again, I'm from La Frontera, from the border city of El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. I was uh, born and raised between uh, two cities, which kind of creates this um, very interesting dynamic. Um, so uh, just to talk about a little bit of uh, where my parents are from, um, because that informs a lot of the work that I do. Uh, my father uh, was raised in Zacatecas and uh, my mother was uh, born and raised in Durango. So um, we kind of met uh, in life and they migrated north and they ended up in Ciudad Juarez, then migrated uh, to the United States, which we kind of settled on El Paso. So that's kind of a little bit where I come from, or, you know, my family comes from. So the dynamic in the border is uh, very specific. And I think almost every single border city, uh, their dynamic uh, may be a little bit different. Um, but I think one of the biggest things that uh, many of us can relate, especially the Latinx individuals, is uh, not being American enough, and in my case, not being Mexican enough. And um, there's this always this um, dynamic that exists that, you know, with family, it's kind of like you're treated like um, you're like the American kid, but then also when you're in the United States, you're treated like, uh, you know, this, you know, the Mexican kid. So it's like this, this, um, this uh, counter um, uh, coexistence exists of uh, you're kind of stuck in between two different cultures. And um, so I kind of want to briefly um, show you a little bit. Um, I did a performance uh, based off of that. And uh, this happened at Blue Star here in San Antonio, Texas. And I talk about a lot of like, you know, what informs my identity as uh, a person with a Mexican background and that is uh, religion and also how I relate to uh, being American. So in this specific performance, uh, what I did is um, I had this strip of land and or soil and uh, throughout the soil I did have um, different uh, components um, that kind of resemble um, things that you would, that are, you know, cultural in, in a sense, as far as uh, religion, um, also like uh, culturally like American and Mexican. And uh, what I would, uh, what I did in the specific performance, um, it's kind of talking about like when you try to own your cultural identity, but you're always dragged for it because you kind of come from this dynamic of both places. And uh, so what I'm doing here is uh, I'm kind of like stomping on everything and kind of breaking everything apart. And um, it, you know, there was different, um, just different things, you know, there was mirrors, uh, there was um, dolls, there was truck, like toy trucks, there was um, ceramic figures. Uh, flags, so different components that kind of um, identify to myself. There's also tunas, which is a prickly pear to the cactus. Um, so I, I use a lot of these um, elements in my work, uh, but as I continued, I eventually wrapped my wrapped my feet and I um, dragged my, my body or I pulled my body, dragging myself through the soil and kind of leaving this imprint. But at the same time, I was dragging my body to like different shards of debris. And um, so it's, you know, it's, it's this sense of kind of how I said it, it, you know, when you try to own your identity, uh, I felt like I was always dragged, um, you know, uh, and I mean that in the way that the sense like damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? And it's, um, it's kind of like this double standard that exists. So I wanna talk about uh, kind of, um, so I'm gonna start in 2016. Um, I, well, just growing up myself, I was uh, never, um, I was always closeted. Um, it was very hard for uh, myself to be queer. Um, one, and it's because it's, uh, it's, a, it's something that um, is taboo and, uh, you know, and specifically in BIPOC um, communities. So in 2016, I was really impacted um, because I was, you know, I was finally out, I came out later on in my life, I came out around age of 23. Uh, so, you know, coming out and finally, like, um, being able to be in these safe places, uh, that's when the, um, the Orlando massacre happened, which was a Pulse night, uh, nightclub shooting. And um, I was impacted by that because, uh, you know, in, a, in an instance, when you try to find your uh, community and uh, a safe place to be, 
especially in my, you know, in my case as a queer person, um, that is completely uh, desecrated, right? And it's um, and it becomes something very, um, very sad, and also it becomes something scary. So I just kind of wanted to uh, bring this specific work up because I'm going to kind of talk about from when I started to where I'm at today. And uh, so what I did uh, for this specific installation um, on white handkerchiefs, I uh, wrote uh, on every handkerchief, I, um, I wrote all the victims of the Orlando nightclub shooting and their age and which they were affected. Um, a lot of them were young, you know, all their uh, ages ranged, but um, this is kind of uh, paying an homage to them and uh, paying my respects to them. And I wanted to use the um, a white handkerchief because white is something that is associated with purity. And also it's something that we use to, when, especially when we grieve, when we cry, it's something that we wipe our tears with. And I decided to suspend them to also kind of mimic this idea of a tear. And on the um, on their corners, it's it, it's a pink triangle, which the pink triangle, um, since you know since then now ha is actually a symbol of pride. So the pink triangle was some the upside down pink triangle is something that was used uh, in order to mark um, uh, homosexual Jews in the concentration camps, and uh, then that specific. Um, that specific uh, image was taken out of its context to for it to hold uh, power, right? And uh, it's, now it's become a symbol of uh, pride. So, um, so I just kind of wanted to bring that up. Um, this was shown. Uh, it's been traveling. Uh, the work has been traveling. So, this is kind of just um, what it looks like. And then, um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump into the La Misma Piel where um, Elena and I actually, uh, I think, officially met. And uh, so De La Misma Piel, uh, I was really, um, so when I was in school, I was, my concentration was ceramics and I really wanted to step away from that. And I wanted to really dive into something that was uh, deep and personal to me. And um and I wanted to jump in into this uh, full force uh, being a, a queer person of color, right? And uh, how, um, uh, and you know, it's just, I wanted to talk about these specific things, how, where I come from, how the border informs who I am and, and also how, um, what, what do we do also to survive uh, as a person, but also I wanted to share my experiences as a kid. So this is uh, De La Misma Piel, which is of the same flesh. And um, the reason why I titled it uh, such is because I used um, a lot of, um, the main thing that I used in this specific installation was leather. And I used uh, leather belts and then uh, leather remnants. And I did use some belt buckles, but uh, the whole specific work on its own is about um, the idea of uh, discipline, right? And how the belt, me growing up as a kid, how the belt was always a tool of discipline to correct our behavior, but also uh, talking about the lineage of men and how these men would always wear these belts with their last names um, stamped into the back. And it's kind of this uh, sense of carrying on your pride and uh, by taking away that, what I did is I went ahead and replaced um, that specific name. And um, I, I had these uh, belts tooled with um, uh, derogatory terms in Spanish. Uh, and they're all, and they all pertain to things that I would hear as a kid and growing up, you know, it's always uh, this idea of correcting uh, my mannerisms or my behavior. Anytime uh, that it, anything could have appeared maybe feminine or anything like that. And um, so all these belts are, you know, are tooled with words like uh, joto, delicado, maricon, puto. And all these words are um, there, you know, all these bad words are just kind of taking the place of, of these men um, kind of uh, carrying on their specific, um, uh, their message, I guess. And uh, so, this is a, a close-up of the work. Uh, 
maricon, which is, so they're all derogatory terms. And it's things that I grew up uh, listening to, but also, or hearing, right? But also it's a, it's also this dynamic of a constant hit, right? Every time, even if something that was said, even if it was not directly to me, if I heard it around the house being used, it hurt me a little bit, right? So, um, so in a lot of my work, I do talk about assimilation, right? So what do we do to protect ourselves? And what, what do I do to protect myself? What do I do in order not to become that person, right? Um, and it's really, it's like hiding yourself. That's, you know, like you really have to hide yourself and you have to create this tough skin outside. And that's kind of what I talk about. And I um, can show you um, the belt buckle that I use. So this like flamboyancy also that exists in the work or that exists in these objects already is also something that is never taken to be um, kind of, uh, you know, either feminine or um, it's not really looked at as a, like a flamboyant uh, as, or gay for, um, you know, for lack of a better term, when these men are wearing uh, such things, right? And we, we can talk about like the big uh, belt buckles or rhinestones on their belts or uh, flashy shirts. And it, you know, this is this thing is, oh, it's fine because they're macho that, you know, that doesn't, there's no, there's no problem because this person's using it and they're not gay. So, but then also there's this kind of thing that exists there that it's, it's almost like not fair, right? Because when a person, when a queer person is using such things and is using this flamboyancy with pride, you're seen through a different lens and the lens that you're seen through is you're seen as a faggot, right? And you're seen, you're seen through as, as a, as a person who is completely different. So uh, this is kind of where I kind of started diving into this specific work. And it's because it, you know, hits close to home and this is my per personal experiences that I have uh, suffered through. So, um, so uh, then I started kind of really taking these objects and um, the, the power of the objects itself that existed behind them. So, you know, we're talking about belts and then I start talking about hats as well. So growing up, you know, uh, my father passed away when I was 10. So there was no male figure to raise me. And um, when something like that happens, you have all kinds of men from the family trying to raise you in their own image, right? And um, so what ends up happening, you know, it, you have all these, um, you're told all these things from different angles that come at you uh, that tell you how to be and who to be. And, um, and as a kid, I, I do remember, you know, all my uncles would wear sombreros and all, you know, like my grandfather was still alive. Um, both my grandfathers were still alive um, then too. And, you know, they would wear some, but they would wear this as a symbol like of a power, right? And when they were, um, when they, it's very interesting to also see the dynamic uh, that exists, it's, you know, this whole performance of masculinity is, is, perfect example of it because sometimes these men would be in the comfort of their own home and you know it it was it, because they're not being seen there were there was like a leeway to be just a normal human being right and relaxed and whether you, your leg is crossed or uh, whether you ask for you're using uh you know, a feminine uh, smelling soap or something of to that nature. But as soon as these men are in the public eye and they go out, they have to play this very dominant macho um, role. So it, it becomes very amplified and it becomes like uh, this person who was created, who is uh, doing a performance, which is also why kind of, um, why kind of time I work also doing performance myself because I think growing growing up and seeing this, it, you know, it, it kind of informs uh, this performative aspect to, to what I do. And um, so, you know, kind of, so what I wanted to do in this specific um, installation called uh, Sin La S, which translates to without the S, I wanted to talk about specifically the men, um, the lineage of men uh, that kind of carry on my last name. So, which is Via Lobos, right? And uh, without the S, it's kind of leaving. Uh, it it doesn't be, you know, it, it kind of loses um, its entirety. 
And um, I'll give you another image of it. So every hat, um, so there are 10 hats because there is 10 letters to my last name. And every hat, if you can kind of see um, like these little droplets, every single hat besides the pink one had a silver letter that was encased in resin and spelling, it was spelling out my last name and then uh, it stops with the pink one. So the pink one does not hold the symbol of power to the last name. And I, I kind of talk about this because there is there was this such expectation, especially after my father passed away, of, of me passing on my last name. And um, it, so this is the idea about passing the last name too. And you know, within also the little droplet of resin, there was prickly pear seeds. And the dirt was also the symbol of um, fermented, like fermenting a seed, right? We're like how planting my seed and um, for something to become um, of my last name and to continue that lineage. And um, so, you know, I wanted to talk about that specifically, like the, mini the meaning of, of my last name, it, you know, as far as um, these men that carry, you know, that, and that expectation of me carrying that that legacy also. And it's kind of like an abrupt stop because um, I'm gay, right? And there's, um, so, and also uh, what I try to do in my work is I, I, I try to take that, that this uh, idea of macho and this sim like the symbol of macho away by flamboyantly decorating it. Um, although some things are, are already flamboyant that exist that they use, but it's just kind of going over the top it kind of like, um, it, for me, it, it, it uh, deconstructs that masculinity that that specific object already has. So um, this is what this specific work is about. And um, I really had fun. And, and during this, um, during the opening of the exhibition, I actually um, created an outfit and I created a hat for myself to wear. And it was performative too. So this is a mannequin um, wearing it. And um, it was very interesting. It was an interesting dynamic too, because people um, didn't know whether to interact with me or not. And the only, one of the main ways that people interacted with me was by brushing the, my back. So on, my, on the back of the outfit, um, there was fringe. And um, above the fringe, uh, there was a, the words that said macho. And underneath the fringe, um, hidden in the fringe says maricon. So people were interested to see kind of what what it said, and it, and it's kind of also um, this weird um, invasion of privacy, right? And it's kind of uh, people wanting to know um, and trying to dig deeper into who you are is very interesting. So this is kind of um, I've always always loved fashion, and this is kind of like how I started introducing it into my work. Um, I have done different types of outfits and hats. Um, so this, you know, this is the first hats that I did and uh, this specific layer of fringe kind of hides into the hat. So where I can lift it and the fringe falls, the second layer of fringe falls hiding uh, my face completely, um, which is pretty fun. So it's also like, uh, it's also this, um, using this also to a different extent because when I see uh, these like very uh, flamboyant outfits that many men wear that are performers, right? They're very, uh, they're glittered, they're rhinestone, they're shiny, they're, they have everything. And it's just how, going back to it, they never, they're never seen as this um, feminine person. They're always seen as macho because they're, they're straight men. And when somebody of the other kind of uses that, it changes the whole, the whole viewing of it. So, um, so yeah, so it had a lot of fun, it, it, you know, but also it was also trying, it was also concentrating on how the people would interact with me was interesting. And that kind of led to um, another uh, installation that I had here in San Antonio. And um, so after uh, de, la, uh, de la misma pie, I'm sorry, um, sin la S at, that was at the Mexicarte Museum in Austin. Um, then I wanted to talk uh, something that was also personal, but it, it was not my story, and it was it was a history between two brothers, which was my father and my uncle. And um, so, just to kind of give you a background of uh, what the work is about, is 
Um, when my uncle was uh, young, he tried to come out to my father and my dad um, beat him up. And he said that he would not allow him to be himself until the day that their mother passed away. So um, this whole uh, this whole uh, thing, you know, it's going back to assimilating to who you know to your culture and what you know and um, protecting yourself, right? And um, my uncle buried his true self for many, many, many years, many, I'm, and I'm talking about maybe fifty. And um, and it's kind of the you know it, this is something that is repetitive that keeps on happening that we're told who to be and how to be. Right. And it's also um, it may not be that that direct of a message as far as somebody telling us who to be in particular, but it's sometimes a decision that we have to make in order to be safe. Right. And in order to um, not uh, face any abuse, whether it's physical or um, verbal abuse. And um, so this specific um, installation is about my uncle and my father and um, and kind of my my uncle living in the shadow and kind of bearing his freedom in order to um, in order to satisfy these expectations that that the family had for him. So so there's this is saddle and uh, underneath the saddle in its shadow is a cactus and it's kind of um, you know, it, it's something and. I mean, it just how I explained it before, you know, it's kind of living in the shadow and it's something like stunting your growth as a person, right? Not being able to get, get, you know, get the nutrients that you need and the help that you need and the support that you need that kind of stunts who you are and kind of, you're kind of left in this weird in between, but also looking at the symbolism of um, the flowers and the color, the color yellow in particular. So the color yellow is known to have two specific meanings um, through history and through theory. And it's one is um, being a coward and a uh, second one is uh, being courageous, right? And for me, it's kind of that specific dynamic, you know, um, having, you know, it, it, and it's weird because it existed, right? He had the courage to come out, but then he shrunk himself, right? And he became a coward to not own up to his own word. And uh, so it's like this meaning of like all the amounts of time or years that he um, kind of built this up within himself. And it's the whole wall is covered with flowers. Currently this installation is actually um, uh, at the Atlanta Con uh, Contemporary. It actually just opened. Um, I was chosen for the Atlanta uh, Biennial. And um, I also did a new performance, which is uh, was fun. But I miss performing live. Doing this whole virtual stuff is a uh, is a little bit different. But nonetheless, um, this is um, this is a specific work uh, that is being exhibited. These are just detail shots. And then for this specific um, opening, I did a performance called Fag. And uh, for uh, the performance itself, I uh, had a leather belt that was um, not stamped into, it was just a clean leather belt. And in front of about maybe 300 people, I did this performance in which I uh, told in the words macho into the belt um, using like metal tools and a mallet. And, um, but, uh, you know, it, I was, with every single word, with every single letter that I would stamp into, I would I would um, recite something or I would say something. And um, once I'm finished tooling the belt, um, I uh, begin to tool my own forehead using the same tools. And um, you know, and I I did do it with four. So uh, after the performance, I. Um, I was very, you know, I kind of bruised and I had a bumped forehead, um, bumpy forehead, but it's kind of this idea of um, you're always kind of seen as this particular person. And uh, interesting story, um, I performed this at the Blanton Museum of Art. And when I did do that, I didn't know I had to perform it twice. 
So I did the performance once. I screwed myself, you know, be all my my forehead up, and um, and then they tell me, okay, well, your next slot is at this time, and I did not know that, so I had to reperform everything, and so I was like really hurt after that day. But um, so yeah, so th this is one of the performances that I did. I also created the outfit, um, and I had um, on the shoulders. I had these. Um, uh, horseshoes that were that were like kind of shoulder pieces and they would kind of fall with fringe I did this um whole um uh sun the sun uh, like more glasses with fringe and then my pants uh I don't have a picture of it there, it's somewhere in my Instagram uh but I had these pants where I would they're um old like western ranger pants or um wranglers uh the uh polyester kind and every time I would walk the sides would open and they would flare and they would kind of show this like um, glittery tool so they were like bell bottoms every time I would walk they would kind of like open up it was really interesting um, but this is uh, just kind of like how I tried to incorporate like my love for fashion and different things and then I kind of um I kind of want to talk about uh, cicatrices because that uh, kind of coincides with this idea of uh, a scar and believe it or not, I do have scars from that performance. But uh, Cicatri says, um, was, a, uh, was a specific um, solo exhibition here local. And, um, and the reason why I titled Cicatrices, which is scars, is because um, all the, I guess it's like, uh, I think a scar, you know, a scar is a reminder of something. And all, all these works kind of tie into all these things that I had to endure uh, growing up. And um, it kind of um, connects to it in that way. Uh, so this picture that you're seeing is actually embroidered into a wall. So I created a whole wall and I embroidered into the wall using rope. And that is um, the, it's called this, uh, the toe stitch medallion. And that is actually on your boots. So it's on the tip of the boots and I can show you one. You can see it, but. I don't know if it'll be visible, but you can kind of see my boots. So that's what that is. And um, so I, I kind of wanted to, uh, it's like this also talking about like my culture and where I'm from. So it's kind of something that is embedded within our walls as people. And this is why kind of I, I, I created that specific installation. And it's kind of like the, you can see somebody standing there so you can see like how big it is. And um, so I started using uh, different uh, things that I've seen men use. Um, I remember my brother-in-law had a whip uh, and this is a whip, um, you know, made out of like a deer hoof and kind of, you know, it, or, you know, or sometimes it would be just like a, a braided piece of leather, but it would like their keys were attached to it. And it was like something that was very masculine. And um, I kind of wanted to talk about how do I deconstruct that? How do I make it? Um, how do I make it not as masculine, right? And so I gave them all manicure uh, manicures. So um, they all have different types of nail polish, and um, the piece itself is called Man I Cured because um, uh, it kind of ties into growing up religiously and always using. Um, the word of God as a way to correct certain behaviors and certain things and cure you. So, um, so yeah, so this is, this is a, a, an installation that I did um, out of many installations. This is another one. Uh, this is a deconstructed hat and uh, there's golden chains and within the chains, there's small golden pearls and white flowers. And to me, uh, this specific work ties into the idea of being pure and uh, purity, right? Um, all, you know, the mentality of just being like this man is like you're pure because you're like a pure man. And, and it's also talking about, um, you know, when I, when I came out, um, when I came out as gay, um, all of a sudden I was seen as somebody who was tainted and somebody who was not right in the eyes of God. Uh, my mother stopped talking to me for a bit. Um, 
so you know it's always like religion was pushed on me and um this also ties back to um all the the conversation so when my father was passing away um my father passed away of cancer and he had a conversation with all the men and he had told um all the men in the family which was the husbands of my sisters and my brother that they should treat all women like a white pure pearl and um to take care of them as such and this kind of also relates to that because i never got that conversation so i felt that i was never um i guess uh, worthy of having that conversation um so yeah uh this is kind of what it ties down to and it's kind of this uh white flower that's kind of floating in the middle this resemblance of purity of uh, being the pearls being considered women and uh, these roses these white roses and men and it's just kind of this thing that is held in between this space And then um, I did this also installation where I had a um, casket. And um, in the casket uh, is like a pure white and it has golden um, finishes to it. And within the pillow, um, it says, En paz descanse tu libertad, which stands for May Your Freedom Rest in Peace. And um, this comes down again to. Um, this whole idea of um, kind of not being yourself, right? And kind of like putting your own freedom at rest to be able to satisfy those around you. And it's also kind of this connection to, I guess, growing up and seeing a lot of death in my family, specifically with my father. And, um, excuse me, sorry. And, um, and it's like this, at a time that you're vulnerable and you try to um, you try to be with your family, you can't because you're seen through a complete different lens. And um, and it's kind of like you have to bury that freedom to be able to to be able to have those connections with your family at times. Um, but yeah, uh, so this is what that piece is about. <clears throat> and I uh, during the the during the exhibition, um, I did a performance. It was a site-specific performance. And um, it kind of dives into um, also kind of um, being dragged into uh, this space in which you're told of how to be and who to be. So I was dragged in by horse into the corral. Um, this was happening at the Luna Ranch. Uh, the, which is a curator's and the gallery owner's um, parents' ranch. So um, I kind of get dragged into um, the corral by horse. And in the each, um, kind of like almost in every section of the, of the uh, corral or the corral, there is um, um, bales of hay, which were super heavy. I want to say they were probably like 70, 80 pounds. And um, for every single bay, uh, bay of hail that I carried, I wore high heels and walked around in this uneven dirt. And it's uh, kind of talking about uh, always walking in this uneven, um, this uneven surface, right? Of how, how as a queer person I have to navigate, right? And it's like, you get these spots that are kind of iffy and you get these spots that are okay. So I, you know, I carried these and I started stacking them on the tower in the middle of the corral and I started to spray paint them. And, um, and then I kind of, um, so I run full force into uh, this kind of tower of, um, of hate and, um, and I start to tear um, all the bales of hay apart and I start to stuff my own body with the hay. And, um, yeah, so, you know, kind of stuffing everything is kind of like this idea of like seeing who you actually are and then kind of taking that part and um, putting it back in so that nobody sees. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this specific performance has also traveled. Um, I was able to perform it in uh, Iowa, which was very interesting. And um, 
but it was it was very impactful i feel um because it's predominantly white and kind of having like this brown person uh, perform for a very large white audience was interesting but also it was uh it was very important because these are things that um people don't maybe um kind of register that we experience because um sometimes our culture is deeply rooted and we are deeply silenced for a lot of things but yeah so um i'll kind of jump into what i did last year um last year i started uh covid was um crazy so i kind of just i was supposed to start my residency at the joan mitchell foundation um residencies um center in new orleans and I only experienced it like for four days and I was supposed to be there for about three months and got canceled. Everybody was told to go home because of COVID. So I had a hard time kind of um, developing work at the beginning. And then I just started developing work because I was like, it doesn't matter whether I have a show or not, I should play around with things and develop, develop work. So I developed this very interesting um, kind of um, armature that goes on my body and I carry all these hats. And, um, and they're kind of, it's like this, um, it's a stack of uh, just like, um, it's like almost like a, a peacock. So, uh, so the, the way I was inspired by this was actually by a peacock and um, talking about how men are always showy, but the woman can never be showy, right? Cause then they're always controlled by the man. Uh, so it's like, this is another aspect of also machismo, but also when you're gay, you're not supposed to be too gay. Um, so you're always in this weird controlled environment, right? And um, so the peacock always shows its feathers, a male peacock shows its feathers and it's very like flamboyant, very beautiful. And um, so that was the inspiration behind this, but um, also uh, I created a way to be able to move these. So um, every single hat was attached to um, uh, like a thread or a string, when I would pull them, they would come down and they would reveal the text on the hats. And um, in the hats, it says, chinga tu machismo, soy joto y que, which is uh, fuck your machismo, I'm a faggot and what, right? And it's kind of like owning who I am and um, being showy about it too. And um, it was very interesting. And I fell in love with this idea also like strapping things to my body and using them. And that's kind of, you know, some things that are kind of uh, in the works for that too. But um, so I decided to do this as a photo and then also was able to present it at the Mexicarta Museum uh, last year. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to wear it because there was no audience since everything was shut down. Um, they just had like a virtual exhibit and then they kind of slowly opened to the public. So this is my whole installation as a whole. Um, I the actual um, installation piece in the middle is called um, "Los pies que te cargaron," which is the feet that carried you. And this kind of talks back uh, to, or it talks about this idea of you're always told, um, uh, you know, like who who carried you into this earth, almost right? Like you, it's always like this how culture can be very divisive and how um, family can be divisive to be able to kind of shape you in the, when whatever they think is appropriate, you know, and you're always kind of, um, you're, you know, it's like that, that backhand that you get, and you're, you know, or chanclazo and, you know, or just remember who, you know, who brought you to this earth. And it's, it, it's kind of that same feel. And it, it's, so I created this small, uh, uh, corral, right? And um, in the actual, uh, on the saddle there underneath it, there's um, a pulley system. And all these um, hands are kind of reaching outside of the, of the corral. And they're trying to reach for flowers, which is like, uh, for me, like flowers is like the symbol of like uh, liberty and uh, something very beautiful that you're trying to achieve, but you can't. And they're trying to reach it because they're being weighed down by these um, cement feet. I can now show you. So I casted my own feet uh, using cement. And uh, so all these like, you know, all these uh, hands are tied into and, and underneath the, um, the saddles where all the pulleys are. So every rope is tied to a hand. 
but uh you know it's like this thing there's just they don't reach outside of the barbed wire they're kind of uh, just right before they can get to it and then also did a video performance um for that specific um installation which was a projection that you saw um and that um that performance is kind of talking about this idea of love and bear, you know, kind of um, the idea of of love in a sense that um, you know, especially for men, are always told that affection and love is different, right? Like it was fresh where I'm, you know, this is where I'm coming from. Not I'm not saying that everybody's like this, but um we're always told that affection is something that is received and never given because you don't want to seem uh less than or um you don't want to seem like weak or anything like that so um but yeah that actually should be uploading on my website soon and this is kind of currently where i'm at so i'm currently in a shift in my work and um this is a very exciting shift and I kind of wanted to talk about uh, the existence of queer uh, bodies in um, in very important history, and um, I myself connected to this in particular because I come from El Paso, and El Paso um, was one of the main processing centers for the Braceros. So, if you don't know what Braceros are, Braceros were Mexican farm workers that were contracted by the United States to work in American farms. It was this agreement between Mexico and the United States. And um, so they were brought in to work the fields and uh, to pick fruit and to plant and to, so it was all these farms and they were all contracted, all Mexican farm workers. And um, this is something, one of the most important um, uh, things that happened during World War II and it's kind of, we hear about it, but then it kind of like subdues and we forget about certain things. But in my case, being from El Paso and El Paso being one of the main processing centers actually took the time to go and experience the farm that they were processed through and sometimes held for a couple of days before they were assigned to whatever farm they would go through. Um, I was able to kind of experience um, this location and um, really inspired me to talk about, um, kind of wanted to talk about was how can we don't talk about the existence of queer men in these spaces this is we're talking about the mexican uh for the for the majority was there were all men and there was these big barracks and farms filled with nothing but mexican men and we never talk about queerness and the existence of like sexuality right and um there has been um some important people that do talk about it um you know in some publications but um, rarely have I seen, uh, you know, like artwork um, in that sense. So uh, it was a very interesting research topic for me and kind of um, creating work. So um, so the image that you see here uh, is a hoe and um, what they were, what the Mexican farm workers were giving to work as a tool was a short handled hoe. And the short handled hoe um, caused a lot of, um, it was a symbol of oppression really because these men were being controlled with a small tool and were told to work long, long sunny days, whether it was in the cold or whether it was in the summer, whatever, whatever, whatever it was, they were told to work with these very small tools and their backs were arched all the time. Uh, so, you know, it was almost like uh, it, it, it's, it's a very messed up way to um, have people work this way. And um, so I wanted to take in this idea of um, also making them um, flamboyant in a way. And I, and I talk about um, the specific, this installation in particular is very interesting because I'm talking about one individual, um, his name was Porfirio. And uh, I came across Porfirio through doing research and um, I read one of, well, I read a dissertation and I read a publication or a book by, um, Dr. Mireya Losa, which she talks about the Braceros. And uh, in it, she uh, has conversations and she has interviews with different um, men who were part of um, this whole movement. And um, in it, um, she asks uh, whether was there such a thing as gay workers and 
um you know and it's very funny the description that it kind of ta- it goes into is like you know the man holds his belt buckle and he laughs you know you know very deep and he he's like tells the other person to tell her about them right and it's uh, so this exhibition is called De Los Otros, and De Los Otros is of the others, and that was a term that was uh, used to um, call gay people. So um, so this specific uh, story or the, it work follows uh, the story of uh, Porfirio, which was um, a man who I found very interesting because uh, he would cut off the power lines to the barracks to sleep with other men. So, um, and everybody knew that that was happening because in, you know, in, in the research that I've done, it you know, it was a lot of um, just the conversation, like we knew what they were doing because we could hear noise. And um, at some point it was, it, um, they knew that he had just a partner in it, but he would cut off the power lines um, because he wanted to remain anonymous and he wanted to protect himself and the other person. So, the, you know, it's kind of going back again, this, this whole idea of oppression now, right? It's also kind of hiding who you are in a different historical context. And, um, you know, it, it was very interesting. So I, since the, the short hoe was used, um, I developed this whole um, quote that I wrote um, based on kind of the inspiration that I took in from. And, um, so in the hoe itself, I cut out um, a whole sentence. And when the sh- light shines through it, uh, the reflection of it um, on the wall, you can read it as a sentence. And um, the reason uh, why this looks like this is because um, as a kid, I o- would always remember like my friend's dads or um, even some of my uncles, I believe, um, their trucks, their shift sticks, would be something encased in resin. But uh, it was usually something very like um, considered masculine, something like um, maybe like a scorpion or um, I don't know, a bullet or something uh, to, to that extent. But um, so as an entirety, let's see. This is kind of what it looks like. It says, esto es mi ser, soy uno de los otros. So this is my being, I am one of the others. And um, so, yeah, I mean, this is kind of, uh, these specific letters are made out of soil and they're made out of soil from El Paso and river water from the Rio Grande. And um, holding it as a binding agent is cotton from the, um, the Rio Vista farm, which I went to in El Paso, which was served as one, one of the processing centers in El Paso. And then I recreated their, um, their barracks or their beds or their bunks. And this is a window space so you can see it through the outside. And that night, it's a little bit different because it, um, so I kind of created this sense where at daytime you can see it as such and at nighttime it gets activated. And um, it talks about the story of him, of uh, Porfirio and another man um, kind of laying with each other. And uh, in two of the bunks, you can kind of see here faintly uh, lit is a red heart and then embroidered is tu. And then on this bunk over here, you can barely see it, but um, it says the word yo. So tu yo, which is you and I, but also all together tu yo means yours. So offering your body to somebody or yourself to somebody. Um, and then I'll show you what it kind of looks like at night. So these kind of um, every five seconds, one turns on and it shuts off and then the other one turns on. So one's in red and then the other one's in a white and uh, kind of like tie back the red to to this idea of uh, like adultery and sin. So yeah, that is kind of uh, where I'm at now. And uh, yeah. <laughs> well. Thank you so much, Jose. I, I do want to make sure that we open up to Q and A, and I'm yeah. I'm hoping that everyone's um, catching on to just how nonstop you are because you said, oh, the pandemic kind of slew you slowed you down a little bit, but right. this is this is work the, about the Bursero program is at art pace right now. 
Um, I just attended a virtual talk with you at Art, Art Pace, learning about this specific work. You just flew back from Atlanta right. um, for the, uh, the biennial there. So yeah. you're pretty much uh, working nationally um, is uh, like, like the pandemic isn't even happening. I can't even imagine if, <laughs> yeah, I can't even imagine if things didn't slow down for you, what you, what you would be doing. And I know you have really developed um, quite a clean and powerful aesthetic that you can look at your work and there's enough symbolism that's repetitive throughout your bodies of work that you can look at an installation and know, oh, this is Jose Villalobos. Um, and I want to make sure that we're giving um, everyone in the audience a chance to ask questions. Uh, we, oh, we do. We have one. It says in the chat box, what artists or books inspire you and inform your work or this work? Um, which work were you talking about, Vero? Are you talking about the Bracero uh, work at Art Pace? Yeah. Yeah, so the Bracero work was, um, well, I mean, originally the inspiration behind the Bracero is because it's where I'm coming from. I come from the border town, right? And I come from El Paso, which was very important. My grandfather was a Bracero. This is kind of how I dove into that. So uh, my grandfather, my mom's father was a Bracero, and um, that kind of sparked an interest in like, okay, I want to know more. And, um, but I think that um, kind of researching, uh, so what I read uh, was Mireya Losa, and I can give you the name of the book. Give me one second. Sorry, it's, I think it's like a long name. That's why I'm looking for it. Um, but I did read her dissertation first, and then I read her book after. So it's called um, Defiant Braceros, uh, how migrant workers, oh God, give me one second, went away. It's called Defiant Braceros, how migrant workers fought for racial, sexual, and political freedom. Yeah, and also I think another thing that informs my work would definitely be uh, Gloria Antaldúa. Um, because she's also from the border. Um, her literature is beautiful. And uh, yeah, it's very informative too, as who I am. Wow, um, Adriana just put a really fantastic question. I gave you the ability to unmute yourself if you want to ask, um, or do you, Adriana, do you wanna ask him? Are you able to unmute? You're not able to? Oh, try again. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it works. Well, first of all, Jose, muchas gracias for tu presentación tan excelente. Thank you for such an amazing presentation. Um, it's been a while since I saw you, so I'm sure there's a lot to, uh, to catch up. But based on this presentation, I wanted to ask you if you could define more the notion of the safe place, you talk a couple of times about it. So what is a safe place? And also how can the art gallery be, if it is a safe place when you engage with the role of the victimizer and the victim at the same time, as well as very difficult topics like trauma, violence, um, negative comments, as well as the stereotypes? Um, I think it's, and this is kind of goes back to what I had said earlier too, is like, when we, when we, when we think we have that moment of like, of safe, of, of a safe place, it, it, it kind of certain things happen that, de, you know, determines its degree of how safe it is. And what I mean by safe is, you know, it, for me, it's, a place um, where you are welcomed, where you are invited, where you are supported, um, where you're given, um, you know, where, where you're given uh, the time of day to be listened to, right? And to maybe even resolve if they have, this person or these people have um, been at fault of anything that may have caused violence, whether it was verbal or physical, and how, you know, to be able to, to to have that 
conversation with them and them learn can also create a safe space, right? But I think that um, in a gallery uh, too, right? Uh, especially when I'm performing, um, that is something that is kind of a, a roulette dare, right? I, I don't know um, who it believes in what or what, right? And I, I do absolutely become um, vulnerable because at times I, you know, I'll be doing a performance and and to connect it to maybe um, an exhibition that uh, Elena had curated me into. Like I took all my clothes off practically, you know, and and to kind of um, have these people around you. And in the case of anything were to happen, you know, I. I I don't have anything to protect myself or if that were the case, right? But I think that, uh, you know, it, it's, it, you know, just experiencing it or explaining off my experience, you know, uh, sometimes um, the safe place, it, it's sometimes unreachable and it's something that maybe, um, it's something that, that I think we're all working towards and it's kind of like a never ending thing, but, um, you know, and, and it can be, uh, you know, it can just be like somebody's comment or somebody's thing can, that can be uh, related to as violent or, um, I don't know, uh, rude or not. Uh, I'll give you a perfect example. When I was in El Museo de Ciudad Juarez de Arte, um, it was a very, I had my installation with my belt and, um, you know, some men were kind of, uh, like aggressively weird with me in the sense that, you know, they would scoff and they would laugh or, and um, especially also when I did like a tour um, was very interesting. Uh, and I didn't, in that tour, one of the special moments was one of the fathers who had his son and he asked, what, why, how are you, how are you not scared, right? And I tell him I am scared. I think I'm scared every single day of my life, but, in order to be able to correct what we do and to better the environment that we're in so that it creates a safe place, this is what we have to go through first, right? And, you know, and it's kind of also, we talk about removing um, content from different things. Like why to remove that content? We need to know the violence that existed in order to correct it. And I think that's kind of where I, um, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Do we have another uh, hand up? You can put your hand up and I'll give you mic permission so that you could ask your question directly. Does anyone else have a question in the audience? And I'll flip through all the screens to make sure I'm looking at all, all of you. Well, I have a question, Jose. You know, you balance um, history and social issues and contemporary uh, social ills uh, like the Pulse nightclub um, within a conceptual practice very well. And I think this is something that the students are really navigating, especially in a social uh, justice or social practice sense. How do you talk about important issues um, within um, a conceptual practice rather than um, uh, a figurative one. And I think your balance of performance and also um, thematically using text-based works right. a lot is also helpful. Would you give a little commentary on, on balancing activism in a contemporary setting? Definitely, I think, um, I think text is extremely important, right? Uh, so that I mean, that's what I mean, you can the, the obvious one, right? That's like the obvious um, uh, answer to uh, to that specific in my sense, right? I do use text a lot because we are so used to text, whether it's a sign that we see, whether it's your text message, whether it's a book, whether it's an ad, whether, you know, all of this um, or a graphic design, you know, it's something that our eye draw, you know, pays attention to. So it's one of the ways that I use that, but also um, spoken word in my performances can work, right? Um, I do talk, you know, I, some performances do have speech in it. Um, some performances don't. And, um, and it's kind of, uh, I, 
the way I treat my work is I want people to understand, right? And we're not talking about, I'm not talking about the people who, um, and, you know, for lack of a better term and excuse me, but, you know, I'm not talking about art snobs who are using, who are talking in artist statement mode and who are talking in this uh, weird, like, um, art jargon. Like, that's not, you know, my audience is, is the people, right? My experiences as a person, right, is how I come across in my work. And um, I think it's very important for people to be able to understand it, which is why sometimes I create an installation. Some people may not get it, right? Uh, maybe maybe some people can understand it using performance. That's where maybe a performance can come into play or using text. Um, but for me, for me, that's very important, right? Like the imagery that I'm using and why I'm using it sometimes is not relatable to everybody. So how do I make it, you know, so that people can understand? And I think one of the, one of the ways I can do that is by using performance and using text in the work. And sometimes it's not even English text. Sometimes it's Spanish text, right? And you know, how do we how do we um, make it make it accessible to others? And you know, it's just kind of trying to figure figuring that you know, trying to figure that out is important to me uh, on many levels because how I said, I mean for me, the, the importance of the work is for the people it's gonna reach. And those are the ones that um, it can be a teenager, right? I've done a performance that talks about the rising suicide rates of teenagers um, that are closeted or that are gay because, um, and their only resort is suicide because they don't feel safe because they have this, um, they don't, they don't have that support. And, you know, for me, it's that my experiences and how these, uh, how these kids or how maybe a, an adult man who was never able to come out um, can have that, um, that comfort to be able to talk to me about that, right? Uh, whether it's a simple conversation, whether it's a message, whether it's relating to the work somehow, that is important to me. So I think that's kind of uh, where the activism part is, you know, it's, because, it, you know, sometimes it's kind of like you're preaching to the choir, but when you're, when you're make it, making it accessible to many, many, many people, that is what the importance of the work is. Hope that answered your question. <laughs> Absolutely. And your work is so powerful. I think, especially watching performance, like you said, all the different modes of communication that you might be putting forth your meth message. I've been in a room with a performance that you could see everyone's faces, their just heart is spilling into the space um, that you are in. So uh, you definitely have the ability to communicate with everyone um, and, and nationally and internationally, you're not preaching to the choir um, for sure. You're, you're reaching a lot of people with all of your, your work in right. a very powerful way. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of questions happening in the chat box, and I would uh, I would invite you, Hannah, to ask your question. It is not silly because um, remember, Jose, that 90% um, of this room is emerging artists, and they're trying to figure out um, how to proceed in their practice and how 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 to work in the art world. Um, right. Hannah, I didn't want to interrupt. I'm so sorry. Um, my, my question was, how much did those hats cost you? Um, or how do you acquire your materials for your installations? Because I know hats in particular are a pretty penny a piece from yes. what I understand. Yes. And I wanna add, if I can, add yeah. Hannah, I can't believe you're not saying how much did that casket cost you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, okay, because Jose can speak to winning grants and being that, a successful yeah. artist. Uh, yeah, so I'm sorry to cut you off, Jose, because I just wanted to point out how much of everything. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's things can get pricey. I, I mean, you're looking at boots, you're looking at leather, you're looking at belts, you're looking at caskets. Um, it can get expensive. I mean, the way I try to source my material is I try to source them also um, through community, if I can. Right, you know, um, by going to um, maybe like a, a seller who is in the flea market, you know, uh, that's how I get my materials. I go to flea markets um, specifically because I'm supporting an individual person's shop. So, you know, this is this old Mexican couple that I go that I went to, 
uh, and that's how I acquire my hats is, uh, you know, I, I try to help people out. So I think that's very important. Um, but I mean, it, it kind of amounts to a lot, right? Like it, use 10 hats, you know, I've used multiple boots, um, but in turn, what has helped me a lot to be able to purchase such things and to um, be able to kind of make the work is um, just, uh, God, it's like, you know, it's like applying to things, applying to grants. Um, you know, my the Joan Mitchell Foundation grant I was actually nominated for. That's a grant that you need to be nominated for. And then you apply and then you, you they'll tell you if you get it or not. Um, but that grant itself was $25,000. So um, that's a big chunk of change. So you should, when I got that phone call, I was happy. I was jumping up and down. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe they selected me. And this is like a very well uh, nationwide um, foundation that, that has it's granted me that, um, you know, the TAN Foundation grant too was just um, something I got in the mail once and it just said, you have been awarded the, the TAN Foundation award and that was a $7,000 award, you know, it, and it's uh, certain things as such, also getting exhibitions, um, you know, institutions who are willing to pay for materials is important. Never be afraid to ask and, um, but, um, I'm going to answer kind of because it kind of relates to this and there's this question about um, the gap between gallery space and community space and galleries being classist. Um, I think it all depends in, um, you know, for me, it's, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot that, that exists, yes, but also it's talking about the opportunity, right? If we have an opportunity for myself, I'm talking about myself. If a opportunity is given to me to be able to uh, have a queer brown man in a uh, big gallery or a museum, you bet your ass that I'm going to take it, right? Whether it's classist or not, because I can go into that space and I can talk about that, right? And talk about um, talk about uh, how we break those barriers, right? And how we make it a better space, and um, and it's you know community spaces do exist, and there's um, you know, galleries that are not um, for profit, nonprofit galleries or institutions are also important. Seeing also being well informed to where these funds are going to is also important. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, if you can get a, an exhibition or an opportunity that allows you to, that gives you a budget, you know, um, also it's important to be realistic as far as to what they're looking for and what um, what they're willing to pay. If you give them a high number and they don't want to pay for it and just be like, hey, this is a breakdown of what it's going to cost. This is what I want to create or this is kind of what I'm talking about. And we're like, okay, well, maybe we can do this much. And then it's kind of, it, it's a negotiation and it's, it's sad that it gets to that. But especially for a BIPOC artist, it's always a negotiation and that needs to stop, but it's kind of like this nonstop battle that it's, has been ongoing, right? Because you can have a museum wanting your work exhibited to paying you like maybe a couple of thousand to getting the museum paying for like an Andy Warhol to be shown for like millions. And that's, it's just, that's kind of like the realm that we live in. So how do we fight that stigma? You know, it, it's, it's very hard, but I think slowly kind of infiltrating these spaces and kind of talking about that is good. And it's just being well informed. You know, do you go to community um, engagement meetings about the city where the funding goes? That also is important, right? That is like, um, it is political because this is what we're doing. This is our jobs, right? This is, this is where our funding goes into. And I think that that's also very important to know. So, I mean, if, all I can say in regards to like the elitism or classist of galleries, it's like also be well informed to um, to what space you're looking at because sometimes that may not be the situation. And um, but yeah, I mean it's just it's a very um, it's a very dog eat dog world out there for especially for artists. But we try our best, and I think uh, as long as we keep trying and pushing, I think that's kind of how we break those walls.
And Jose, I think it's safe to say you've done a lot for your artist community as well, um, being the co-director of Clamp Light for many years and making sure opportunities are made and lifting up other artists. And right. I, I think, do you have any um, advice to give the emerging artists in that sense, this idea of making your own opportunities so that you build a portfolio and you have a platform to show of your work so that you could be in the space that you're being nominated for super prestigious <laughs> grants and, and getting $7,000 letters in the mail. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, all I can say is, um, I mean, to that question really, what has really helped me out a lot is um, to really stick to who you are as an artist, to be humble and to always, always, always be willing to help, right? I didn't, nothing was handed to me. I had to work for it. And by keeping and uh, persisting that work, right? And just keeping that mentality of just wanting to keep on working because you want to have your work in a space or whatever, maybe you can set yourself a goal, whether it's a local gallery or if it's a museum, right? Um, I think that's a good way to start because then when you start helping, whether it's a gallery, I started helping painting galleries, for, you know, whatever, a friend's gallery, or I knew somebody who needed help can you help me paint a gallery wall? Yes, I would volunteer my time, right? And um, it's a lot of just um, engagement, talk to people, never be afraid of speaking to people. That's, that was my number one fear was uh, networking because I was extremely shy and um, how, you know, I always get scared of asking a dumb question and you know, there really isn't such thing as a dumb question when you're trying to understand how everything or the environment works and how you can create an opportunity for yourself, right? And, um, you know, just talk to people. I think that's the most important thing is to network, right? Because maybe, and it's also uh, being professional in the sense that um, you keep uh, up to date too with your work and your website and all that stuff counts a lot because if you're gonna refer somebody to your work and they see your website and it's kind of like low quality photos and, uh, there is, um, there's missing information or it's like your website, there's, there's really, not, you know, you have to like, think about like how much you're, you're also working that professionalism. Like I hate doing emails, but you have to do them. And, uh, it, it's just like, that kind of goes with a lot. It's just the way you present yourself to people, be humble. Don't be a snob. Um, <laughs> like it, it, I can't say that, you know, I am that just, um, but that's just the way I grew up, right? Um, sometimes we can't help it. There's some people who just were, had a different type of household that I did. I'm thankful for everything that I've gotten and you know, show your appreciation, whether it is a thank you note or a letter or an email uh, to people who acquire work. You know, It is also good to send them a something, you know, whether it's an email or a letter or get their phone number. You can talk to them, be like, thank you for acquiring my work. I just want to express my gratitude. This is what this helps me with. And they're doing it for a reason too. They're doing it to support you, right? So I think that's also another thing. Um, but it really is just uh, be humble, um, volunteer your time um, just to help out. You know, none of us like to work for free, but sometimes we've got to do it. Um, that's why the, you know, kind of the term volunteer exists <laughs> because it's something that you want to help a cause right? And uh, when you just try to understand what is happening around you at all times, because if you don't know what's going on, then you're not informed and you may not um, get that opportunity that you're looking for. And you just have to create it. Like you have to like really try, just don't wait for somebody to just give you the opportunity. You have to put in your time too. I think that's the number one thing is put in your time with everything because this is a job as an artist that is your career this is who you're going to be you know that's your goal so you have to do all of that but yeah and i i think we, we're quite over time but i do want to um honor this one comment in the chat box so that maybe this will be our our closing remarks was someone is asking you about the rattle state snake belt piece that was not in the presentation but if if it's oh. not in gears too much, would you tell us a little bit about it? 
Uh, yes. So I can show you, I'm going to share my screen really quick so people know what I'm talking about. Perfect. Um, okay. Let's see. Where is my website? Okay. Okay, so this is the piece um, that they're referring to. Uh, so what was the question? I'm sorry. Um, I think they just wanted to know about the background of this piece and more about it. I lost the chat box, so I don't Yeah, no, that's it. fine. Okay, so yeah, so this specific uh, work relates to um, the assimilation of your environment, right? So um, snakes have to kind of... Um, protect themselves and kind of uh, take in the colors of their environment in order to uh, be who they are. So this is kind of what that piece is. Um, so it's just, um, it's just about assimilation into what well, my, you know, for myself, my culture and uh, my environment that I'm in. And um, yeah, and it's just kind of also adding that femininity to uh, the work itself and using um, the inside of the snake to be all um, bedazzled and jeweled. And um, yeah, so this was a part of a bigger installation, um, but I decided to kind of just upload it individually onto my site because I wanted to rework and it's okay to rework your work. So I re actually uh, reworked that work. And um, so in that specific, um, I don't have it on my site, but what it is, it's uh, I created a, um, a pair of pants and a Western shirt um, out of clear vinyl. And uh, I made this huge wall of a pink print. So uh, when I hung these pieces of cloth, they kind of just like flattened to the surface, right? Because they're kind of see-through. And uh, so it's all talking about um, uh, simulating yourself like a, like a, a snake. So, um, and also, you know, it, it was just also like another, that for me was a fun project, but also, you know, it's just uh, tied to my cultural, um, to my cultural uh, traits um, from the Norteño, uh, being a Norteño. And uh, my father was a musician too. Um, he played the accordion. So this is things that he would wear. So, yeah. Jose, we collectively thank you so much. This talk has been amazing. We're uh, so grateful you stuck with us through the technical difficulties in the beginning because I, I think you made a great impact on the PCAD community. There's a lot of warm uh, comments coming in through the chat box um, saying how fantastic it was for, for you to tell us, share about your practice. So thank you. Thank you so much for making the time to visit us virtually um, in Pennsylvania. No problem. Thank you for having me. And also, if you have any questions, feel free uh, to message me. You can message me on my Instagram and it's just my name, Art. You know, so it's Jose Villalobos Art. And uh, you'll see it. I have a uh, cowboy hat with knives on them. And um, you can definitely message me and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions or even just to have a conversation. I'm always open. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Good night for now. <laughs> Good night.